Panther Router is an incredible and versatile machine, but you probably already know it can do way more than just mortise and tenon joints. Let me show you more. So my goal was to make a template for the Panther Router where I could take a tenon that goes all the way through a mortise, then with the Panther Router and this template, cut an angled dado on each side of that tenon. And here you can see that that angled portion of that dado is angled at five degrees. Okay, to start, rather than trying to cut that odd shape out, I just made the jig in four sections. All right, that looks great. Now in uh, true Ramon fashion, <laughs> we're gonna hit this with a belt sander. And oops, I'm slightly out of frame here. This jig was simply glued and pinned together. I made part, parts of it a little bit extra big and then trimmed it to size. And the angled part is five degrees. Then over at the drill press, I counterbored holes on each side so we can attach this to the panda router. All right, there it is, sanded and ready to roll. Oh, and see that extra little part? I'll show you what that's for toward the end of the video. So we can slip this guy in place and just loosely for now, right? Now we're cutting those angled dados one at a time, but there's a left and a right. So to ensure accuracy, we'll use a stylus in that center hole to locate the straight side of the shop made template. So once I had all my mortises cut and had my tenons cut, and incidentally the tenons are slightly loose, I mean, you could make them tighter, but these are slightly loose because they won't get glued. They'll just get that forked tusk. Then I can simply add a mark to show the face, the outside face of that component. At this point, I'm setting the height and the maximum travel that the bit can go. I certainly don't want it to hit the, <laughs> the panther router table. So that's the maximum distance down that the bit will be able to travel. There's lots of ways to do things, and I suppose I could have put a sacrificial board underneath the components to be routed. But this is how I chose to do it. Oh, and here's how I came up with the size of that template. I just used a 19 millimeter bearing at the bottom portion of that template. All right, so to make this tapered cut, does that show up? A little kind of a tapered dado, I guess, right? I know that when the tenon is inserted and I mark a line right there, that's to the straight part of that dado. See that? So I need to move the template that I previously set up one inch because this is slightly less than one inch because this needs room to tighten. This will make more sense here in a bit, but in other words, when this gets inserted, I don't want that cut flush with this surface. I want it slightly back so that the tusk tenon can tighten everything up. So we can easily move this over. So, and remember, it's a two to one ratio. So if I need to go an inch, I need to move over two inches. So what we can do is use these segmented pieces. This is already a known two inch distance. I just put that there and tighten this up. So the initial placement of that jig was just to give me an accurate baseline or starting point. And I can loosen this template, slide it over this two inches, which will in fact move the router bit one inch. Okay, I can put this back and now I'll move the camera angle and you can see that the router will be cutting right where we want. I'm gonna have to handhold to get in there, but there's the mark. You see the bit comes in. I don't know if that shows, but the bit is a little closer to the shoulder. So in other words, the line will get cut. That's just about right. Okay, so these tenons are about a half inch. See that? About a half inch, and we're gonna be using a 3 8 bit, and the sample, this sample is, I think I used a 5 16 bit, and in hindsight, that's probably what I should have used, but this will work. And so 3 8 off of half inch would give us 
maybe a little over a sixteenth depth. So a little over a sixteenth depth dado right here. That'll make this slightly under three eighths so that when we cut a three eighths groove in one of these, it'll fit over it without any restriction. So I can make contact with the bit against the tenon. Let me move the camera angle. Okay, with the bit against the tenon, I can slide this over just to hold my position right there. And then I know I want to go in about a sixteenth. Well, not about a sixteenth, maybe a sixteenth plus. These make excellent spacers, right? So sixteenth plus. I just grabbed a bit that was here. I've got 1 16th, 5 64, so I just moved up one size. So it's cutting a, a heavy 16th, and I'll use that as a spacer here. And that should do it for us. All right, so I went ahead and made the cut without you, uh, but it's easy to see what's going on here, yeah? So at this point, I could probably set up a stop and run all my pieces on each end. In other words, if this was the cut I was making, I would cut this one here and then flip this around and cut this one here. Do all of them and then set up to do this side. So of course, these components would have a top and a bottom, and which means that one side of each tenon has a left and a right. So I did all of one side and then exactly the way I set up the jig to begin with, I can set it up again utilizing that stylus in the center hole and sliding the template till it just makes contact. This is my baseline. This is directly related to the component that's sitting on the table and the end of the tenon is at the center of the table. That's our baseline. And now I can use one of these two inch segmented pieces to move that template two inches, which effectively moves the router bit one inch. It's a two to one ratio, you have to remember that, but it's a very effective method of accurately knowing exactly where the router bit is going to cut. So hopefully this isn't as complicated as I'm making it sound, but once you get in your shop and start messing around with the pantry router and the template, it'll all make sense. Now, the height of this tenon that I'm cutting is about an inch and a half or 38 millimeters, but you could make this to whatever you want. Great progress, and with all the angled dados cut on each face of all the components, I switched bits to a 3 8 diameter, and we're gonna start cutting these grooves and some extra long material to create these fork tusks. I want these grooves or slots in the tusks to be centered, so I just utilize a section of that material. You just use a section in the template guide, and that's gonna put that groove in the center. And I'm gonna make these about mm, two inches, 50 millimeters or so. So I have a template here that will cut a two and a half, which will be plenty long. So in general, the format that I use for setting up the panda router to make cuts is I establish or create the length of it of that cut or the shape of that cut or the travel of that bit, whether it's vertical or lateral, horizontal, and then the height that the bit will be cutting into the material, and then I will establish, we set the depth of the cut. So it's basically a three-step process. And of course, this part is pretty straightforward. You're just making a groove. And uh, I would cut one while the board is still long, then cut it to length, and then just rinse, lather, repeat. Super easy. At this point, I didn't want this part of the tusk tenon cut exactly to length because I still need to cut a ramp on it. And I wanted plenty of length to be able to do that. And I'll show you what I mean here in a bit. All right, here we are. We have four tusks, and they are not to length, but they're the same length. All right, remember this extra little piece that we made sitting next to the jig? This will be part of another jig that we will use to cut the ramp on these tusked 
uh, fork tusks. All right, remember this piece that I saved when this was made? And so now this dude I attach to this one. Just cut this quick and easy. This will cradle these pieces that we have to cut an angle on. And this goes like that. This can go against the bandsaw fence. This dude will go here. And now we have something to cut that exact angle that we cut on these pieces, right? So this angled dado was made with this jig. We're utilizing the same jig with the same angle to cut these ramps. This is a Woodmaster blade, one inch wide by uh, Leno, I believe. And it has a bad weld and you can hear it. Well, you can actually see it moving back and forth and it doesn't really affect the cut, but it is a little bit annoying. But it works well. And boom, we have a nice angled piece, which we can easily clean up. Well, I couldn't help myself. I wanted to see how this fit even before the tusk tenons or the fork tusks are cleaned up. And truthfully, the groove on that angled dado could have been a little bit deeper. So I could have probably used a quarter inch bit in, to make the groove so it would have a little bit more bearing. But for what this is, it should be fine. It's all downhill now, right? We're just going downhill on that ramp. A few swipes with a hand plane. Boom, those are looking pretty. Wedges are interesting. They kind of act like screws. You know, a fine thread is going to give you a uh, better torque value, tighten better. And so I might even shoot for a four degree taper next time I do these. Five degrees seem to work, but I think four degrees would tighten better. You certainly don't want anything steeper than five degrees. Then here at the belt sander, I just round over the top end of each one of those fork tusks after cutting them to length. Then with a shooting board, shooting plane, I cleaned up the bottom end of each one of these tusks and then each face as well. Simple, clean, fun, effective. <laughs> Yeah, man, these fork tusks came out awesome, and I'll show you more of that here in a bit. But I wanted to show you another aspect. This top rail where it meets this vertical piece, that's like a half lap, an edge half lap. There's an inherent weakness in creating that, and I'll show you how, to, how I got around it. Here you can see if those dados went all the way through and met each other, that would completely cut out. It would leave a weak spot there, very vulnerable cross grain. Okay, here you can see I have a stop in place. You can see, I don't know if you can see that little bit of blue tape on the stop. I needed a few more thousandths to make sure that I was centered because cutting a dado on one face and making it exact on the other side can be a little tricky. So you have to do some test cuts and sneak up on that perfect fit. So the distance that I'm measuring here needs to correspond to the groove that I'll be cutting on the upright piece and that depends on the two face cuts that I just made. It worked out perfectly. So here's the template end. I got a couple of vertical templates, right? And I spaced this in between here by using this guy. Here, let me move this. I used this in the center and I brought these in until they made contact with that. And that gave me an equidistant uh, position for each one of these so that I could use this center mark on the table, right? And then with this stylus in here, once I fine-tuned it, I added this stop so that I could put it back repeatedly and make all those, you know, fine-tune adjustments. And then I just added a stop block here, clamped that in place, so that was the bottom of that little saddle. And so that creates that area there. Man, I got to tell you, this stuff is too fun. So the thickness of this upright piece has to correspond with the width of the dados that I just created, right? So this thickness here, that just needs to be just a few thousandths uh, narrower than this saddle part, this 
this dado so that'll fit. So I make everything a little bit big and then just sneak up on, on, those, on those pieces. And the goal is to get them all the same so that they're interchangeable wherever you put it. So I somehow missed getting footage of this, but the opposite end of these uprights that have the blue tape on them, they have these two little notches. And see those? They're called a relish. And that's necessary for the two pieces to engage. Otherwise, you'd have to notch the round corners on those dados, which I thought would be more work. And then a couple of coats of uh, urethane and oil finish. And <laughs> to me, they're all the same. And boom, we have a couple of bench sawhorses that you could knock down and store. Fantastic, yeah? Let me show you how these go together. So just to show the breakdown capability, this is the box that I actually packaged this in to send it to the IWF show in Atlanta, along with some other fantastic woodworkers. We'll be doing some demos, including this template for the Tusk Tenon. The show will run from August 22nd through the 26th. I'll leave a link in the description. Come by, say hello, we'll talk shop. It's going to be amazing. I am so looking forward to, to being there. So this is pretty standard mortise and tenon joints going together. Those vertical supports into the feet, I guess we'd call them. In reality, those sections could actually be glued. They would still be very break downable. <laughs> is that a word? And then these rails go together. And I put the top one on first before I add the tusks. It just helps it go together a little easier, I think. And these are a little tight, primarily because that finish is probably a little tacky still. Once those are in place, we can drop these dudes in and grab a big hammer. These are awesome. I love them. Been wanting to make these for a while. These will be great for doing glue ups up on my bench or maybe even set them on the floor with a platform for assemblies. Anyway, I hope you found something useful in this video. Remember to click, like, subscribe, learn, and thanks a ton for watching.